All right. So we'll be getting into bitter herbs this evening. And I, for our outline, I'll just make sure my slides are advancing here. So our, our goals for this evening is we're going to review digestion. And for me, whenever I'm presenting on any type of topic, any type of intervention, I really want people to un understand the fundamentals um, in, in regards to what is actually happening in your body and how are we supporting your physiology with these various forms of interventions. And in, and in this topic, we're going to be talking most specifically about digestion. Um, we'll, we will be going into some digestive concerns very briefly. Um, and then when we talk through, again, the treatment portion or the product portion, you'll be able to understand the underlying mechanism of how this is working for those various digestive concerns. Um, we will talk about the difference between digestive enzymes and digestive bitters. Um, and then you'll meet some of our herbal bitters. Um, so our various products in their various applications um, for whichever you know people are, are, are needing to, to use. Okay, so we're gonna meet your digestion. Now I am gonna turn this to the chat and ask the question of where does digestion start? Any guesses? Any guesses where digestion starts? Okay, so I see some people saying the mouth, some people saying large intestine in the mouth, saliva in the mouth, in the mouth. Okay, so digestion is actually going to start in the brain. Okay. Just digestion. Um, what we call for this primary portion is called the cephalic phase of digestion or essentially a, a portion of your brain, uh, that we're talking about digestion. So with the sight, the smell, or even the thought of food, this is priming our digestion. Okay. And throughout this presentation, we're going to be talking about some like lifestyle hacks or things that you can do to support your overall digestion. In addition to how bitters can support that, but this is also why routine is really important to our digestion and a lot of our overall systems. So one thing that you can do to help support your digestion is actually eating at regular intervals. Okay, so if you're eating breakfast at the same time, if you're eating lunch at the same time, if you're eating dinner at the same time, your body is going to anticipate that need. So you're already going to start priming your digestion for the anticipation of food. Um, that's also why cooking is super helpful, right? Because you're seeing the food, you're smelling the food as it's cooking. Um, you're, and, and again, even if like a housemate or a partner or somebody else is cooking for you, um, sneak into the kitchen, get away with everything that's happening. So then your body is going to be primed for digestion. Okay. So after the cephalic phase of digestion, we're going to put food in our mouth. So the next step of digestion will actually occur in the mouth, which is a lot of people, um, what they were answering with. So chewing is going to help to break down food into smaller pieces to make the job of your stomach and your enzymes much more efficient. And yes, your mom is right. That's why chewing your food is so important. Chewing your food is going to break these food, the food down into smaller particles, and it's going to be exposing the food um, to different um, digestive enzymes that are actually in the mouth. So in saliva, we have a specific digestive enzyme or amylase. Um, this is really kind of targeted at more so carbohydrate rich foods. But again, the chewing or the mechanical aspect of breaking down food is going to be really important. Uh, then what happens is we create what we call a bolus of food that's going to be swallowed and moves down the esophagus through wave-like contractions or what we call peristalsis. And peristalsis is going to be important when we talk about what's happening in the, in the small intestine and the large intestine a little bit later on. Um, but then food is going to enter the stomach through uh, what we call the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter. So a sphincter is just a, a circular muscle and that's going to open and close in relation relationship to food. Okay. So ideally that muscle is closed majority of the time. And then the stomach is going to have mechanical movements or churning that will further help to break down the food, but also expose it to stomach acid. 
Okay. And stomach acid is really important when it comes to starting to, or continuing this breakdown of food. And particularly when it comes to protein, protein is a really complex structure to actually be able to digest. Um, so we want to ensure that we have sufficient stomach acid to actually break that down. Um, so then by the time that protein is hitting our small intestine, we're able to have different enzymes to be able to break that food down. So for some people, if protein is an issue with them, so, you know, they're like, I can have carbs, I can have fats, um, but it doesn't seem to matter what type of protein I'm eating. You know, it could be lentils, could be meat, uh, could be a number of different things, but they really struggle with digesting protein. Sometimes my brain is thinking what's actually happening with their stomach acid and do they actually have sufficient amount of stomach acid to break that complex structure down? So once we get um, that breakdown with the stomach acid and as well as that mechanical churning, we're going to see that food or what we call chyme entering the small intestine. And in the small intestine, this is going to be exposed to different digestive enzymes coming from the pancreas, as well as bile coming from the liver and the gallbladder. From the pancreas, we secrete different proteases. So these are going to help break down proteins, amylases that are going to help break down carbohydrates, and lipases that are going to help us to break down fat. Now, the liver creates bile and the gallbladder is what stores it. And then there's a hormonal influence um, that tells our gallbladder to release this bile into the small intestine. Okay, so once food is broken down into its smallest molecules, so amino acids, glucose, different types of fats, it's absorbed through the small intestinal tract. And then this peristalsis or this wave-like contraction is going to move food along the digestive tract. So you can kind of think about it as like a conveyor belt. Once food reaches the large intestine, this is where it's exposed to um, most notably or most predominantly, this is where our microbiome is or a predominance of, of bacteria in our intestinal tract. And then bacteria exposed to this is going to help us to process our waste. It's going to help to bulk our stool, and it's going to help us actually create different beneficial nutrients like vitamin K. And then water is going to be absorbed. So from here, our stool is going to be formed and then eliminated. You still with me so far? <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. So another key factor when it comes to our digestive tract is the vagus nerve. Um, this is also called our wandering nerve as well. And the vagus nerve is going to supply our various digestive organs. Um, and this is really important when it comes to overall digestive function, because our nervous system either lives in fight or flight or rest and digest. We don't live in both worlds at the same time. So if we're in chronic stress, if we're in constant fight or flight, we actually lose that opportunity for us to shift into that rest and digest. So the vagus nerve is essentially like a light switch, right? So it's switching us out of that fight or flight and into the rest and digest. Now, when we look at, again, different lifestyle factors of what we can do to support this and how this can look to optimize our digestion, are you sitting down to eat? <laughs> and no, that doesn't include the seat of your car, okay? Are you sitting down to eat? Uh, could you take a couple, you know, deep breaths before your meal? Is mealtime absolutely chaos for you where you're chasing down like kids and having them seat and fighting over like what they're eating? Um, is it really stressful? Are you eating in front of the TV? Um, again, eating on the go, all of these different things. Are you actually in that rest and digest state to actually prime your digestive function? So when our nervous system is in that rest and digest, we're going to upregulate our digestive function overall. So again, that whole process of what I just talked about on the previous slide, we're going to increase salivation. We're going to have appropriate hunger responses. So better um, fullness and hunger cues. We're going to increase our stomach acid. We're going to increase our digestive enzymes. We're going to improve the production and the flow of bile. Now it's also going to promote peristalsis as well. 
So increased blood supply um, to our digestive organs as well when we're activating this vagus nerve is going to help them function, but also blood is going to be readily available to pick up nutrients being absorbed in the intestinal tract. And don't worry, I know that was a lot of information, but we'll go over that again with, with our bitters. Okay. So some digestive concerns. So I like working kind of top down. So understanding heartburn and indigestion can be an issue for people. So is this acid reflux? Is this feeling like food is just sitting there? Um, so this can often be related to issues with stomach acid. Now, this can be related to what we call hypochlorhydria. We're not making enough stomach acid or what we can also call gastric insufficiency or we're not making as much stomach acid. Um, and making acid is a cascade. Okay, so acid is going to beget acid. So when we start that um, production of stomach acid, that will trigger our cells to make more acid than to make more acid than to make more acid. So this is why when we look at things like lemon water, when we look at things like apple cider vinegar that are by nature very acidic, this is going to tell our stomach cells or our gastric cells, yep, we can facilitate that cascade and we can make more stomach acid. When we lack sufficient stomach acid, we can experience indigestion because we aren't properly breaking down our food. So food is going to feel like it just sits there. We can also have bloating because these food molecules aren't being properly broken down. Um, this can be A, because then our digestive system is further struggling to, to break down these foods even further. Or this might also be related to stomach acid or insufficient levels of stomach acid, preventing us from regulating the amount of bacteria that we're actually looking to populate into our digestive tract as well. So this can make us more prone to dysbiosis or an imbalance in our gut bacteria. One of the most common symptoms I see is suggestive of like, uh, bes besides like indigestion or bloating uh, can actually be bad breath or like a bad taste in the mouth. And that's because we're not actually triggering that stomach, the, the muscle on top of the stomach to close. So we can actually be smelling stomach contents and stomach acid. Um, so again, this can be a little bit of a treatment or an identification that maybe we don't have sufficient levels of stomach acid to trigger the closing of, of that muscle on top of the stomach. Now we can see that, you know, with that bad breath or the bad taste in the mouth, but this can also be related to acid reflux and heartburn, right? So if we're not closing that muscle on top of the stomach, we can see acid splashing back into the esophagus and causing irritation. So oftentimes issues with acid reflux are from making too little stomach acid as opposed to too much. Right. So this sometimes can be problematic when people are on acid, acid blocking medications for decades. Right. Those are meant to be a short term treatment, especially if there's irritation or ulceration in the stomach where we don't want a ton of stomach acid. But again, long time consequences, long term consequences is we might not be making sufficient levels of stomach acid and that can have implications or further implications on our digestive tract. Okay, so common causes of decreased stomach acid. So we just talked about the medications and this is a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, stress, so being caught in that fight or flight. And this is one of the most common causes that I see. And it can also be related um, to issues with histamine or if people are on a lot of antihistamine medications because uh, we do have receptors in our stomach that are related to um, histamine. So it can actually block acid production as well. Okay, pain, bloating, and gas. I would say bloating is like one of the most common symptoms I see clinically, and it can also be one of the most vague symptoms I see clinically. So stomach or intestinal pain can be an alteration from um, the digestive tract permeability or integrity. Um, this can be related to causing bloating and gas or alterations in bowel movements. Now, difficulties with digesting our food. So previously talking about digestive enzymes or stomach acid, 
Um, bloating and gas can also be related to an imbalance in our gut microbiome. So whether this is related to yeast overgrowth, whether this is related to bacterial overgrowth, so especially in the small intestine where it shouldn't be, so in a condition called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or it can be related to what we call pathogenic or infectious type bacteria. So is this related to um, C. difficile? Is this related to um, salmonella or like food poisoning? Um, or is it related to other types of fungi or, or par parasitic infections as well? One of the most effective ways that we can look at supporting reduction of bloating is actually fasting between meals. Okay. Uh, you don't need to be constantly eating. I'd say this, except in my patient populations, like in pregnancy and breastfeeding, where we have a really high calorie demand and they have attention that is going in a number of different directions. And I just need them to get calories in, but the average person should be fasting at least two hours between meals. And the reason that this is is important is when we talk about peristalsis or that movement along the intestinal tract, um, this is from these wave-like or nervous system contractions that are happening. And this full cycle of this nervous system stimulation is between 90 minutes, <laughs> 90 minutes and two hours. I see, I feel personally attacked. I know, I know. <laughs> when it comes to the eating on the go, when it comes to eating constantly, again, these are just lifestyle factors, but again, we have tools, right? So sometimes it's not um, always feasible to change the lifestyle stuff. And that's where we have tools and able to support you with that. But yeah, fasting between meals is actually ideal. We, we don't need to necessarily get fancy into like the intermittent fasting. And my patient population that I work with is primarily women. And we don't have a ton of data on the benefits of intermittent fasting or how hormones influence intermittent fasting. But we do know that fasting between meals is very healthful for our digestion because we're allowing the opportunity for food to move along the intestinal tract. We're allowing the opportunity for bacteria to move along the intestinal tract. But if we're continually disrupting that cycle, again, then we have to kind of reset and then we're not actually getting that full movement or clearance or that conveyor belt kind of shifting everything along. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that, that would be one factor with that. If we need to snack, then that is okay, especially if there's a workout in between there and we need to refuel. But if this is a constant occurrence and you can't go longer than an hour without eating something, we have to really investigate what's happening with your meals. And again, there are different variations for every person. There are different medical concerns that that might not be feasible, but for the average healthy person, fasting between meals is going to be ideal. Um, so there's a question about fasting between meals. Can we drink water? Yes. Please drink water. Please drink water frequently. Yeah. And I would say that's the perfect time to be drinking water is actually between meals as opposed to at meals, right? Because then you can dilute stomach acid. Um, obviously, the acid is very strong, very potent. But again, if we actually move hydration away from meals, that's actually the ideal. I don't mean to make people feel personally attacked. Yeah. And then fasting overnight, I usually like fasting overnight is a thing, right? And so for some people we're determining their fasting window. Um, so maybe it's like from eight to eight, that's a great 12 hour fast. Um, and sometimes it's not necessarily when you break the fast, but it's how, um, and so definitely we're want, wanting to do that, um, with something that's high in protein. So we're not getting a spark, spark, spike of carbohydrates first thing in the morning, which can actually impair our blood sugar regulation for the entire day. So leaky gut could be related to, you know, the pain, the bloating, the gas that we talked about on the previous slide. Normally intestinal cells are nice and tight. We call them tight junctions. And this is disallowing things that we don't want from the external world. And when I say external world, your digestive system is one to one long continuation of the external world. Um, and so when we have these tight junctions in our intestinal cells, it's blocking things that we don't want from the external world from coming in, 
right? So the things that we do want are going to be nutrients that we're going to have specific channel, channels for. But if these tight junctions become impaired, whether this be related to inflammation, whether this be related to infection, different food additives, anything that can cause disruption with our, um, with the integrity of those intestinal cells can cause issues with, um, like absorption issues, either we're not absorbing our nutrients as efficiently, or we're having this cross reactivity of things from the external world coming into our digestive tract and our immune system is freaking out, right? So then this can result in allergies. This can result in different skin issues like eczema, acne, psoriasis. Um, and we also see this being really highly correlated to a hormonal condition called endometriosis. This is often a, a common, um, common comorbidity of that as well, or a concurrent condition. Okay, constipation and diarrhea. So motility issues can be related to nutritional habits. Um, this can be related to fiber. This can be related to hydration, uh, nutritional status. Um, so that can also be related to um, impairment of your digestive fats or impairment of digestion of your fats um, that can cause constipation or diarrhea as well, um, or neurohormone causes. So the signaling that's happening from different um, uh, uh, chemical messengers or digestive um, hormones in our digestive tract. This can be related to our bio bowel habits. So um, there's a lot of people who can't poop in public. <laughs> Are they okay? Um, this can also be related to um, bowel, like positioning when you're having a bowel movement. So if anybody uses a squatty potty, that is optimal for your pelvic floor function, for bowel habits, um, not straining necessarily um, when you're having a bowel movement. Um, I refer a lot to pelvic floor physiotherapists um, for optimal you know, bowel habits as well. Um, constipation diarrhea can be related to inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. Um, this is like Crohn's and colitis. We can see other symptoms associated with this bloating, gas alterations in those bowel movements, most commonly on the loose stool side. And again, this can be an imbalance in our gut microbiome. This could be yeast overgrowth. This could be bacterial overgrowth. And again, remember that peristalsis is really important for that. Um, and it can be related to the type of gas that those, um, those SIBO or those bacteria are producing that can increase or decrease um, the digestive motility. And this can also be related to like infectious bacteria as well. Okay. There's some stuff in the chat, but I might get people to pop that in the Q&A box so I don't miss those. Okay, so the left slide is blank on purpose <laughs> because we're going to be repeating this at the end. So we're going to resummarize this. Um, but again, this is starting to help us distinguish between the benefits of herbal bitters versus digestive enzymes, right? So a lot of what we talked about before, if we think about digestive enzymes, right? So they're trying to be similar or um, mimetic essentially to what we have in our body. So enzymes that we release from the pancreas. So again, that are specific for proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. We're essentially using that in a supplemental form. So when we take those digestive enzymes, essentially they are acting as digestive enzymes in our system would. So we can potentially get symptomatic relief with that, right? So especially, you know, we talked about protein, somebody not digesting protein very efficiently. Would a digestive enzyme help? Maybe, right? Um, there are some digestive enzymes where we can have a little bit of um, hydrochloric acid or um, a molecule that's very similar to our stomach acid and can mimic our stomach acid. And again, that's that nice primary digestion place um, where we're breaking down protein from this really complex structure. We're breaking down food into smaller particles to be able to actually be digested by our digestive enzymes. But again, these are being effective when we're taking them. This can also be beneficial with pancreatic insufficiency for digestive support. So if somebody is not actually creating digestive enzymes in their system or pancreatic enzymes in their system, if this is a diagnosable disease, so what we call exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, oftentimes they're actually needing prescription-based digestive enzymes and the over-the-counter stuff actually won't, won't touch it. 
Um, so again, symptomatic relief, you can see what we're doing with all of those digestive en enzymes and or um, stomach acid and or bile. Some digestive enzymes will actually contain a little bit of bile to help break down fat as well. Now we're going to move into bitters. Okay. <laughs> all right. So herbal bitters, uh, bitters are better in my humble, in my humble opinion. Okay. So bitters over you, and then we're going to work into the mechanism of how bitters are working. Um, but bitters is an action, not a constituent. So what I mean by that is that there are many different medicinal compounds that, uh, or constituents that can have a bitter effect in our body. This also includes different types of foods, okay? But we actually come from a culture where we don't have a lot of bitter food by nature in our diet. And when we do have bitter foods, we add a lot of sugar to it, or we're adding spices, or we're adding vinegars or things to augment that bitter taste. So this can be like our dark bitter greens, um, walnuts, endives, dark chocolate, is included as a bitter. Um, again, not adding a bunch of milk chocolate or sweetness to it. Coffee is also a bitter, which is also why a lot of people can't poop without their coffee, right? Because it has this bitter action. It has this bitter effect on their digestive system. So lots of different foods can contain it, but we're so more going to be talking about it from a bit a uh, herbal perspective. So one of the main benefits of bitter herbs is to support digestion, and that's definitely going to be the focus um, in this webinar today, but there is more and more research coming out as to benefits beyond digestion, immune health, thyroid health, blood sugar regulation, which we'll talk a little bit about today. So huge benefits that we're seeing, and I think we're only scratching the surface. We're seeing bitter receptors in um, our respiratory passage. We're seeing bitter receptors in the placenta. So again, I think we're just scratching the surface. But again, one of the main benefits of bitter herbs is to support digestion. So alleviating digestive concerns but also looking to strengthen the function of your digestive system. So even in the absence of digestive symptoms, we can look to support your overall digestion with bitter herbs. So bitters are gonna work in a couple of different ways. You know all about the vagus nerve. We just talked about this. Uh, so bitters are actually going to stimulate the vagus nerve on the tongue, okay? That's your light switch from your rest and digest into, or sorry, from your fight or flight into your rest and digest. So we're literally turning the switch on for your digestive system. And this is going to upregulate digestion as a whole, right? We're going to look to increase stomach acid. We're going to increase our digestive enzymes salivation. Again, uh, regulation of appetite and fullness through, through a number of different means. Uh, we're going to stimulate bile production and flow for fat digestion. Uh, we're also going to see that promotion of digestive motility, or again, that migratory motor complex or supporting that peristalsis. And again, we can look to regulate appetite, not just based off of those um, uh, regulatory hormones, so leptin and ghrelin, but we can also see this through blood sugar regulation. And I think this is really, really interesting because um, I know a lot of people are looking for tools for um, like uh, sugar cravings or appetite regulation. And so bitters by nature, again, the name is they're, they're bitters, right? They're, they are going to taste bitter. They are what they are. And so in our very sugar laden diet, um, we, we, again, we've lost some of those bitter cues. So then incorporating bit bitters can actually reacclimatize our palate. So those foods that we were drawn to that taste really sweet, and we get that like instant hit or dopamine stimulation of ingesting that glucose, we're actually looking to quench that or calm that. Um, and then I've noticed like when I first started taking bitters, that bitter foods that I tried normally started to become more sweet to me or they they the 
complexity of their flavor opened up. Like I remember eating broccoli and like, wow, like broccoli's never tasted so good or never so sweet or complex in the flavor before. And I think that really had a testament to do of not only decreasing sugar in nutrition, but then also looking to prime or adjust my palate to, to have bitters or to taste bitters. Okay. So vagus nerve parasympathetic tone, or again, that rest and digest. So you might also see the utility here for stress, right? So if you are a person or if you know somebody, again, I'm not personally attacking you. <laughs> if you know somebody who just feels like they're constantly wired in that fight or flight, this is a biohack, right? Some people don't love the term biohack. I think it's super interesting to me. How can we optimize and utilize your natural physiology or what your body knows to do? Nervous system pathways, hormonal pathways, digestive pathways. So you could use bitters directly on the tongue to help switch you out of that fight or flight and to look to calm that stress. So previously I would always carry a little bitters in my vehicle because I'm a very calm person, but put me in traffic and I will lose my mind. <laughs> lose my mind with love, but, uh, it's, it's not my calm place. It's not my happy place, but again, I could get out of that stress or that fight or flight by ingesting bitters. And I think it's a really lovely addition. Okay. And I know this kind of begs the question of like, well, do you have to taste the bitters for them to be effective? The short answer is yes, you're going to get the most benefit, the most optimal um, stimulation of your digestion if you're tasting it on your tongue, right? So getting that vagus nerve stimulation. But we have bitter receptors along our entire digestive tract. So even if you're not tasting them, they're still going to have a benefit in your digestion to upregulate that. So the body is actually going to perceive any type of bitter compound is a poison because a lot of our toxic at low doses herbs in, in the wild um, are by nature quite bitter. So the body evolutionarily has developed to be able to sense these different bitter compounds. And when we're perceiving those bitter compounds, we're going to upregulate ways to facilitate the removal out of the body, the breakdown and the removal, right? So we are going to upregulate our digestion. We are going to upregulate our stomach acid, our digestive enzymes, the regulation of motility to get that compound out of our body. So I think that's really fascinating. Um, and then it can also activate and support immune surveillance. So that is a mechanism of how we can support our immune health um, beyond even the digestive ca capacity for our immune health. But that is one mechanism how bitters can you know, be beneficial beyond digestion. So they're going to bind to these bitter receptors. So not only upregulating digestion, but they're going to facilitate the release of a couple of different um, digestive hormones. So one would be gastrin and one would be CCK. Now gastrin is going to be responsible in an overall stimulation or strengthening of our digestive function that over time is going to strengthen the structure and the function of all digestive organs. Okay. Also the release of CCK is going to support pancreatic enzymes. It's going to support our bile production and our flow. It also feedbacks into some fullness cascades or fullness pathways. So then we're getting a better response um, to our food. So we're, our body is able to better acknowledge like, yes, I'm full and I don't need to continually eat or continually need to graze. Um, when we look again at that gastrin tonifying and repairing the overall digestive system, there's a, another mechanism that's happening called like microinflammation. And I know you say inflammation and people get really scared <laughs> about it. Um, but think about going to the gym and lifting weights. Okay. What happens when you lift a weight is we actually cause stress and strain on that muscle we actually tear those muscle fibers and we facilitate this cascade of microinflammation. 
So in our rest phase, we're actually recruiting the immune system, we're recruiting collagen, we're, we're recruiting these different amino acids and things to build protein structures to lay down more muscle fibers so that muscle can grow and that muscle can become stronger. What's happening in our digestive tract is these bitters are creating microinflammation within our digestive tract. We're increasing blood circulation. We're increasing these healing mechanisms to actually lay down better connective tissue or essentially skin cells to strengthen the resiliency of our digestive tract. Because creating res resiliency within the digestive tract is looking to promote overall digestive function. If you have to eliminate 20 different foods to be able to live your life and to be able to go to work, that's not digestive resiliency, right? That's just symptoms in the absence of a trigger, right? That might be necessary and part of your healing phase, but that shouldn't be an inevitable thing for you. So again, this is creating that resiliency with the digestive tract. So you can think about bitters as being like bench presses for your intestinal cells. Okay. So Canadian, I'm actually just going to have a quick peek in the chat. Uh, yep. So answering questions about the replay. Yeah. And we'll be reposting it. Gallbladder. Uh, okay. So one question just about, can it be sublingual, meaning under the tongue versus uh, <laughs> shooting it down? Will it be just as, uh, as effective? Um, okay. So a couple questions about administration. So sublingual versus on top of the tongue, um, because it's a tincture um, and it is meaning that it's based in an alcohol. So we're using alcohol to extract those medicinal constituents. Um, it's a little bit irritating because under the tongue is a really sensitive tissue. Um, I don't like taking it under the tongue personally. I think it hurts. <laughs> um, so I would either say, put it on your tongue if you are strong-willed and brave, think about it being like a cold plunge, okay? It's this hard thing that's good for you. It's working on your vagus tone, or on your, working on your vagal tone. That, yeah, I would compare using bitters to cold plunging, I, and somebody could fight me on that. I, I think it is a good mechanism for working on vagal tone and overall resiliency. Um, but put it on your tongue. If you can't do it, again, put it in a little shot glass with a little bit of water down the hatch. You're still going to get binding of all of those different better receptors. So you're still going to have some digestive increase or digestive capacity. So I'm of the mindset of like compliance. So um, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, because again, you're still getting really good benefits, even if you're not directly tasting on the tongue. Ideally, yeah, I want you to taste it, but um, I don't know if I'm sadistic in that way. I like seeing people's bitter faces, um, but again, that's looking to get the optimal, the optimal benefit. Okay, um, so just to summarize with the Canadian Bitters product here, uh, so digestive support, soothing relief of uncomfortable digestive symptoms like we talked about, heartburn, indigestion, constipation, bloating, gas. And this is a unique spectrum of herbs, which we'll talk about on the following slide that optimize nutrient absorption, critical to many body systems, right? So um, optimal, you, it's not necessarily now you are what you eat. It's truly about you are what you absorb. So you could have perfect nutrition, but if your digestive system is impaired, how much of that are you actually absorbing and being able to utilize within your system? Granted, like healthy eating is important and actually looks to support, you know, a healthy digestive system. But again, the absorption piece is really, really important. Um, and we talked a little bit about sugar cravings as well. So not only are we looking to reduce these digestive symptoms, but we're looking to retrain the body's digestive system, encouraging it to, to function more efficiently ongoing instead of merely providing a temporary solution. So you can probably see where I'm going with this is that um, you're not becoming reliant on the Canadian bitters um, or herbal bitters in general much like you would a digestive enzyme because a digestive enzyme, the effect is only happening when you take it. This is teaching your body to do what it's supposed to do, right? It's beating down the path in the bush. So then your body wants to continually go down that trail. Um, so we're, again, we're optimizing that digestive function over time. Now, this formulation, unlike some other um, herbal combinations or bitter combinations on the market, are non-habit forming. 
Um, and a lot of the other ones can be um, reliant on using laxative heavy bitters formula um, or some of the over-the-counter options as well. Now, if you wanted to offset the flavor slightly, um, we do have a Canadian, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a Canadian bitters also with a touch of maple. How Canadian is that? Like how lovely. Um, so that again is a little bit of sweetness kind of offsets that bitter profile, but again, you're still getting the benefits of those. Um, you're still getting the benefits of those bitters. So I'm going to pop through these ingredients. Um, and then before I start talking about the next product, I'll just have a quick peek at the chat um, and the Q&A box. Uh, so globe artichoke, which is a very nutritive bitter dandelion, and we use both the leaf and the root in this formulation. Gentian, which is a bit more of a stronger bitter, um, but again, we're not putting the most bitter forward herb first, which is fabulous. Chamomile is a really lovely bitter. Um, it works on that peristalsis or that movement in the digestive tract, um, but it's also a carminative, um, meaning it's going to calm and soothe like a spasmy kind of intestinal tract or even like a gassy intestinal tract, um, very sim similar to cardamom. Cardamom does the same thing. And cardamom flavor is lovely. Like if you're actually picking it up in this formula, that's what I taste and actually crave um, these bitters. Um, ginger is also a carminative. Um, it's an anti-nausea anti -nausea agent as well. And it's looking to warm up this formula because bitters by nature are very cooling. Um, burdock, a lovely bitter herb. Um, turmeric, also a lovely bitter anti-inflammatory. Um, really fantastic for that bile stimulation and flow. And then black walnut, which is a bitter as well. Okay. Mm -mm. Also, if you let the bitter sit longer in your tongue versus shooting it, can it be more effective? Yes, if you taste it and if you get that stimulation on your tongue, even better. Okay, so there's some questions. Um, there are, uh, oh, I see a question about non-alcohol. This is for you. <laughs> so your question in the chat about um, recommendations for non-alcohol-based um, products. Um, so we do do a Canadian bitters with apple cider vinegar that is a de-alcoholized formula, meaning we are still getting the potency of a tincture because we're taking the alcohol and extracting those constituents from those herbs, which is necessary. Alcohol is a fantastic solvent and needed for certain constituents and certain herbs and especially with a lot of bitter constituents. Um, but then we are evaporating the alcohol off and then we are adding apple cider vinegar. So it's more of like a digestive shot. Um, the dosing would be a little bit different comparatively to the tincture. You actually take more of this as a digestive shot, but you might not be doing it before every meal. It might be like in the morning, like either in lieu of like an apple cider vinegar shot or lemon water or that kind of thing. Um, but you could use it throughout the day, but definitely in the morning for priming the digestive system. Um, but this would be uh, an alcohol-free version that, that you could try as well. Okay. Okay, so some questions about gallbladders. Okay, so really, really fantastic question because your liver is what is going to make your bile and your gallbladder is going to be what stores it. Okay, so typically then when we eat, that CCK, or again, that hormonal stimulation is going to contract the gallbladder, release bile into the intestinal tract to help break us, help us break down fat. If we don't have a gallbladder, we're relying on the on-demand uh, bile production that is happening from the liver, right? So it's kind of like uh, a water, like a hot water tank versus like an on-demand <laughs> water tank. So utilizing something like digestive bitters is actually going to stimulate bile production and flow in the liver. Um, so it will help you digest fats more efficiently. Um, so yes, it is safe if you've had your gallbladder removed. And I would say actually very advantageous to be taking something that is going to stimulate your bile as well. Okay. Um, there's a question just about Swedish bitters. Um, I don't know if they add any 
else thing else to their products. Um, but tinctures have a, actually really good shelf life um, because alcohol works as a bit of a preservative. Um, so oftentimes what I have with, with my own patients is they might be on bitters um, more often in the beginning, especially if we're looking to correct a digestive disturbance um, or say it's really high stress period where they know that stress is affecting their ability to digest their food properly. Um, and then over time, it's a bit of a self-weaning process or, or working with me and reducing that over time. So then it might be that their bitters is in their natural medicine cabinet when they need it. Um, and so for me, that has also been like, I have a little bitters that goes in my purse to restaurants where I'm eating food that I'm not normally eating, or maybe it's higher fat or higher salt, um, or just like a larger meal, like Thanksgiving or Christmas or birthdays, um, again, that you need a little bit of digestive support. Um, but again, digestive, uh, the Canadian bitters or tinctures in general will have a, a quite a long shelf life. Uh, can you dilute the bitters in water? Absolutely. Um, we even have cute little St. Francis shot glasses. So again, you, you put in the desired amount, um, you add your um, water and you can just shoot it as well. You can taste it in your mouth. Okay question about dosing and how to take this. Okay. So the ideal time to take bitters is actually going to be five to 10 minutes before a meal, right? So it's kind of like triggering that cephalic phase of digestion, right? Where does digestion start? Starts in the brain, starts in the nervous system, right? So if we can um, stimulate and prime digestion before we're going to eat, that is going to be ideal. So take your bitters before you eat, but Famously, I still say that I need a t-shirt. Bitter late than never, okay? If you start eating your meal and you're like, oh man, I forgot to eat, I forgot to take my bitters, still take it. We have all of these benefits when it comes to upregulating digestion. We have that binding of gastrin that promotes overall digestive motility. We have these carminative herbs that are going to reduce gas bloating um, and support, you know, the proper breakdown of food. Um, we even see this culinarily where people are taking um, like a digestif before a meal, an aperitif after. So do it with the bitters. If you forget to take it before your meal, take it during, take it after, that is a-okay. Um, the appropriate amount to use, I believe it's 30 drops, but again, the dosing on the product is probably the most you know, specific way that you can do it. Again, our, depending if you're buying like a larger bottle versus like one with a dropper, it'll have drops and it will have mills. So you can even pull or dispense on the dropper and know how many mills you're actually drawing in there. I commonly recommend 30 drops. Um, and classically, like under, not actually measuring 30 drops every time, but knowing where that falls on, on our dropper, the ones that we have in our clinic don't have the lovely measurements that the St. Francis ones do, because um, we're just dispensing larger bottles. Um, but again, Confirm with the dosing when you purchase, but typically 30 drops. But if you want to convert that to mils or comparatively to, to teaspoons, you could, you could do that as well. Okay. So there's some other questions, but I'm going to jump to um, just my last couple slides. And again, I'm doing good for time for a Q and A at the end. But this is one of our newer products and I'm very, very excited. I see Johnny nodding. I'm so pumped on this. Uh, so this is our Canadian bitter spray. Okay. So this is our classic bitter formula with a touch of organic maple syrup. So again, that Canadian bitters plus maple, how Canadian now in a convenient spray. So vagal nerve function on the go. This is your cold plunge when you're at the office. This is what you're doing to support your vagal tone, um, not only from a digestive capacity. This could even be stress management, right? Getting you out of that fight or flight. Um, I typically recommend that people shake it before they take it. Um, just because the maple becomes distributed into the bottle, it either settles at the top or the bottom. So you want to make sure you shake it. Um, shake it before you take it. Um, uh, the, the sprays will vary. I found that even like five sprays to be really effective. Um, and again, just straight on the tongue. I love it. And again, we talked about bad breath, right? Based on that LES function. Um, 
what about before a talk, right? When you're like in that fight or flight and your mouth goes dry, because again, all of your blood flow is going to your heart and your lungs and you're running away from that saber tooth tiger, stimulating that vagus nerve increases salivation. So you don't have the pasties when you're talking and do, yeah, when you're doing talks. Um, so again, ton of utility, fabulous on the go option. I know we've been getting a lot of requests for this, so it's finally here and we're really, really, really excited about it. And just a warning for everyone. It's not like a nice maple taste. It's still pretty bitter. So the maple is just very, it's just a tint. Yeah. 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 But, but like I said, it's your cold punch that just minimal, minimal pain for optimal gain, right? Love it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So bitters versus enzymes. So again, we're just, we talked about the benefits of digestive enzymes, and now we're looking comparatively to the herbal bitters and understanding, just summarizing everything that we've talked about. So it's a comprehensive approach that targets the root of the issue, right? So we're really getting after increasing the function of our digestive tract. Um, we're activating the pancreas for both digestion, so the uh, what we call the exocrine function, so creating all of our digestive enzymes, and also the endocrine function of the blood sugar regulation, glucose management, insulin sensitization. There's a lot of good um, support with this. Um, helping to regulate hunger and fullness cues, so your ghrelin and your leptin, blood sugar regulation, and then even like bitter benefits beyond bitters, we're seeing liver benefits, um, bile production. So bile is super important for a number of different systems. A, bile is actually an implicit kind of integration or it's a natural laxative. If we're not producing bile on our own, this could be a risk factor for chronic constipation. Uh, it's also important for metabolizing or breaking down our hormones. Like, so we see this again, endocrine or hormonal picture. We see this in nervous system regulation, immune regulation. So the benefits beyond digestion are substantial, but again, we're not creating that reliance um, or continual need to take something like digest digestive enzymes. So just wanted to lay that out there. So before I jump into questions, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for having me um, uh, for sticking on this webinar. Um, I see the numbers barely fluctuate. If anything, they just continue to grow. So it's lovely to see everybody come out and giving up their evening. Um, it's always so fun for me to, to do these types of talks, especially something like bitters that I'm so incredibly excited about. Um, and especially this, this new product and this new innovation for us. Um, so I'm just going to see if there's questions, um, that I can answer, um, before I turn off the recording. Um, and then Johnny's just putting some links in there. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Maple A. Yeah. Apple cider. Yeah. So it's a link to uh, Healthy Planet's website where our bitters are. So um, they're all on sale except for the spray. And the reason for that is that the spray is brand new uh, and it just got added to their website. So Mm -hmm. um, but it is still an inex inexpensive, it's, it's, it's inexpensive. So, yeah. um, but yeah, yeah, they have a great lineup of, of, of the Maduro bitters on there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there is a, a question that came in like pretty, pretty early. Um, but do bitters help with chronic constipation? Um, they can, right. So, um, is it related to bile function? Is it related to, um, that peristalsis aspect or what we call the migratory motor complex constipation, um, is so multifactorial because it's coming from our fiber intake. It's coming from, I always talk about like Dr. B's four F's fiber, fluid as in how much are you drinking, um, fitness as in if you're not moving your bowels don't, and then flora, like what's actually happening with the microbiome. So that is like the pillars with my patients that I work through. And then I'm also looking at um, any type of conditions, pathologies that could be causing dysregulation um, of, of their, of their bowel motility. And even is that related to, um, like sitting position with, with evacuating as well. And I work a lot with pelvic physio, 
pelvic physio floor therapist, pelvic <laughs> physiotherapist um, that help with chronic constipation and they're fabulous. Um, so again, multifactorial, but bitters could be beneficial. Um, are bitters safe to take long-term? Absolutely. Um, and then are they safe for a diabetic? Um, I'm going to say the short answer is no. But that being said, this can depend on um, type 1 versus type 2 diabetes, okay? Um, what bitters are doing is actually looking to create more sensitivity to your insulin, and they're actually looking to optimize regulation or control of blood sugar. So bitters will actually look to improve blood sugar regulation over time. So could it be helpful in a type 2 diabetes? In, in somebody with type 2 diabetes, absolutely. Where it gets complicated is if they're on medications, such as a, a type 2 diabetic that has advanced to that stage, or if we're looking at somebody who's insulin dependent, like a, like a type 1 diabetic, because it's um, looking to lower blood sugar and they may already be taking insulin, we don't want a compounded or a positive drug interaction where we're lowering blood sugar too much because it's actually much more harmful, much, much more harmful than your blood sugar being too high, even like temporarily. Um, so again, that would be some, the short answer is no, um, but that doesn't mean to say that they couldn't, they, we just need to be a little bit more strategic with it because of optimal optimizing blood sugar regulation. Um, without providing a meal plan, what would you deem high protein for a, um, breaking the fast in the morning? I want to see 30 grams. Oftentimes some people I'm just getting focus on 20 or looking at your meals, making sure you're getting a minimum of 20 with your meals, but I would love to see people have 30 grams of protein with their breakfast. Yeah. Um, and then not just straight carbohydrates. That's really not great for your blood sugar regulation. Okay, da -da -da -da. I'm just gonna have a quick peek. Okay, so another question just about other medications. So diabetic medication, I just answered that. Um, blood pressure, cholesterol medication. Um, blood pressure, I'm not too concerned about. Again, depends on the type of uh, blood pressure medication. Um, again, if we're looking at really regulating um, certain um, minerals at the level of the kidney, there could be some theoretical interactions. Um, so have a conversation with the prescribing practitioner um, and or somebody who can do both. Um, cholesterol medication, I would, I would deem this safe. Yeah. Uh, will it help with intolerance? Um, I'm not sure if you mean like lactose intolerance. Um, lactose intolerance is where you actually physically lack the enzyme to break down lactose or the sugar in dairy. Um, so you would need specific um, lactase that actually helps to break down lactose um, as, as opposed to, um, you know, di like overall digestive enzymes. Short answer is no, but I'm not quite sure um, what you meant by intolerance. Okay. But I think you meant lactose intolerance. Okay. Okay. So how long would you recommend one takes um, the bitters for a long or short term? Um, totally person dependent, right? So it could be somebody who I'm seeing where they're just looking at health optimization and maybe um, it's a shorter term approach for them um, initially. And it's more of a maintenance with, with the bitters capacity. Um, it might be more aggressive, like initially off the hop where they're doing bitters with every single meal um, and priming um, yeah, we're, we're looking to facilitate with every single meal. Um, and that might be a, a treatment plan that we're doing for one to two months. Um, and then we're tapering or there might be other things that we're doing with our treatment plan as well. Um, so no hard and fast rule. Um, I find that people actually like self wean a little bit, like when they no longer need it, they're not as quite drawn to it. Um, and again, if those digestive symptoms return, you know, is it related and does the, um, does the bitter and does the bitters actually help to um, get you back to where you were or is there more of an underlying issue that we can't address with bitters like is there a potential microbiome issue is there an inflammatory bowel disease um, that we might need be additional support beyond that 
Uh, how long before you see an effect? Um, some of them, when we're looking at even the carminative aspect for like bloating and gas, some people notice it within the same meal. Um, other people, if we're looking at um, like bowel regulation, if we're looking at um, consistent or persistent bloating, um, it might be three weeks for them um, where, we're, where we're seeing um, substantial changes um, for blood sugar regulation, blood sugar management, the gastrin effect, that's going to be longer than four weeks. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. All right, I'm just going to turn off the recording. So this is kind of the end of that Q&A portion, but then I will continue just answering.